everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here. I thank the board for inviting me. I have to say that when I first got the invitation, I was extremely excited. And then I got this lineup of speakers who are much more established and senior than me. And then I started to question, why am I even here? You know? And uh, <laughs> the reason, like for example, Nick, the first time he did this in 2004, I was just entering high school. And, uh, and uh, uh, no, reference, uh, no reference to, you can draw whatever implication that you want to draw, but, uh, but that's just a pure effect. As a first, uh, we're going to talk about that. And but the reason I want to remind you this contrast is very simple. That is, what you're going to hear about is going to be from a person who is much less experienced and has a lot, uh, is a lot less established than what you'll hear from those guys. Therefore, take uh, my advice with grain of salt. But with that, uh, I'm going to jump right in. Uh, and uh, the talk that I'm going to give today is going to call Why You Should Care About Entrepreneurship and Innovation. And I think a lot of you perhaps have a big idea about what our field actually does. Right? And, uh, but what I want to achieve in this small talk is that I want to give a high level pitch about what we want to do and, uh, and why from a financial economist perspective we can make significant contributions. And then I'm going to spend the most of uh, my time talking about the important trends that is going on in the literature and why no matter what you're working on today can potentially be interested in uh, our field um, as well. So to give you a broad, large, uh, like higher level economic uh, pitch to what we want to study is that we study firm level and economy wide forces that could determine productivity and growth. As a result, you see some sub literature that you perhaps are quite familiar with, with the following key words, for example, innovation, patenting, entrepreneurship, and the creation of new firms. But all that we care about is really about the ultimate goal that we want to explain, which is the productivity and growth of the economy. And that naturally leads us to also care about a lot of broader issues, such as the productivity effect of firms' investment, that is a very corporate financy type of topic, and we also care about the composition and the treatment of labor forces and so on. I'm sure that David will perhaps talk a little bit about that um, as well. So clearly this is not a traditional finance topic, but why financial economists specifically from a few decades ago start to care about those questions is because through the lens of our finance training, we actually can contribute to this literature quite significantly. And here's a rundown of potential things that we brought our financial economics training and knowledge base into answers and answer some of those questions. For example, we care about the role of access to finance, the role of financial constraint, uh, allocation of uh, finance, different type of uh, financing structure on um, productivity and innovation. And we also care about incentives because in this field, the incentives can be flexibly adjusted. Therefore, how do you incentivize innovation and entrepreneurship is a very important question overall. And we also brought in our understanding about financial intermediaries instead of understanding banking. We spend a lot of time thinking about alternative forms, for example, venture capital and private equity. And we also are actually going to spend some time thinking about fintech because it's going to be a new trend when thinking about the financial intermediaries that are linking capital to the, all the ideas that could give us productivity and growth um, uh, of the society. And we also spend a lot of time thinking about the efficient and inefficient responses of the financial market to entrepreneurship and innovation. This is for the asset pricing folks and so on. And we spend a lot of time thinking about for such an uncertain investment, what is the right um, financing structure and do, for, do uh, financial markets actually incorporate uh, innovation entrepreneurship uh, in the uh, uh, correct so with all those kind of background uh, in mind, right, I, I want you to know big picture wise what we want to study and from a financial economist perspective, what has been asked, I'm going to talk about three things uh, in the next, uh, let's say, 17 minutes, I guess. Here we go. Oh, 15. And then we're going to talk about why I'm excited about the research field, and you should too. And I'm going to talk about the classic questions very, very briefly. And I'm going to talk about five emerging questions and potential future directions that could be very useful for those of you who think about jumping in into this specific field. Sorry, I don't have a good sense of cameras, but, uh, but there we go. You don't want to look at this. Like yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then trying to avoid it actively. And uh, why exciting? 
And I think the reason that I find this field to be particularly exciting is because of two forces. One is relevant, the other is interdisciplinary. We have already talked about interdisciplinary, uh, and we heard about it from uh, Gordon's talk, and in fact, uh, that's exactly why I was motivated to study this. And what do I mean by relevant? I still remember when I was a uh, second and third year PhD student trying to figure out what I really want to do. And then I think that my advisor said, like, most of our papers will be rejected. Right? Why don't you work on something that is interesting to you and you feel good? Okay? And then you don't feel as bad when you got rejected and working on something that you actually was not interested to begin with. Okay? So I was like, okay, then I opened the Wall Street Journal and Financial Times and look at what are actually being discussed over there, right? economists and so on, which is actually generally what I suggest that you read on top of academic papers. And then some people care about, for example, the volatility of the asset markets and so on. I think those are certainly important questions. Some think about how, the, how to finance firms and so on. But what I really care about is how our life become the way that we are here. And for example, how did we go from Alexander Bell's first cell phone to an iPhone, right? And then what kind of technological progress? Who founded them? Who are those inventors? How do they actually materialize and commercialize those ideas? And if you want to look at bigger, this is a picture of Shanghai from exactly the same angle, right? And um, from 1990 on the top and 2010, and over 20 years period of time, this is how much change. And what really made all those changes? Is that policy? Is that finance? And how do we think about trade in those kind of contexts? What really made the world look like it is today? And if you actually want to make it even broader, and this is something of my own interest, which is on the left-hand side is the Apollo project, which was sending people to the moon. On the right-hand side is one of the uh, researchers who was working on COVID vaccine. How does the collaboration of research teams work? How do we incentivize those inventors and, uh, and, and scientists to work on the things that really kind of to make people face the challenges that we face today? Those are the specific questions that I really feel like our field could contribute to. And, uh, also, once, and, and also, clearly those questions are important. And not only financial economists uh, care about those questions. Then you've got a lot of chances to talk with labor economists, IO economists, Macroeconomists, those are the three types of economists that I have worked with together. And then but you can also talk with people on marketing, organizational behaviors, business strategy, and engage policymakers to really make a change to what could happen um, in the field. And uh, so that's why I feel excited. And then let me actually run through a few of the questions that have been uh, asked in this literature to let you get a feel of. Uh, uh, the, the, the generations that, uh, that, uh, that kind of have started to maturize. And for example, we care about access to finance. When we study, uh, if we relax the national constraint, what could happen to the mission of entrepreneurship? We talk about the contracting problem in this specific field. We talk about venture capital and private equity to the added value, and so on. And we also talk about how financial markets react to those. I mean, I just want you to develop a basic feeling of what's the traditional paradigm that is, have been used in this research. And now, with this kind of sort of warm you up, I want to point to you five potential interesting directions. And when I talk about five of them, I will see how many of them I actually can go through. I'm going to follow the following order, okay? I'm going to tell you what's the traditional wisdom and traditional paradigm is, and what I think are going to be the new ones. And I'm going to give you a couple of recent examples of working papers or newly published papers, many of them coming from junior professors uh, uh, and some of them from more established scholars to show you what are the examples of those new directions and why I feel like um, those are going to be the exciting areas that you're going, you're going to have a lot of chances. So the first one is what I call the blurry line between startups and incumbents. That is, the traditional paradigm in this research, if you actually open the journal, is that we study startups and entrepreneurs as a special group, which is we always like, we ask questions like, how do startups operate and grow? How do VCs add value to startups? And those kind of things, like as if, like we're in a vacuum that we can only study this. But gradually, I think people start to realize, right, startups do not live in the vacuum. They are actually the minutes that they come in, they're going to compete with the other 
firms, and then they're going to compete across different dimensions. As a result, we're going to talk about startups interact with incumbents in very complicated and interesting ways, not only through product market or labor market competition, but also through potential business collaboration, such as they can collaborate on innovation through uh, uh, mergers and acquisitions, strategic alliances, and so on and so forth that uh, resonate with some of the things that, uh, that Gordon and Chip were talking about, and also through financing relationships as, uh, as well, because 25% of the venture funding goes into startups are actually provided by the incumbent firms themselves. This is from a job market paper many, many years ago, but that's exactly the type of things uh, that we, I, I'm trying to kind of view, uh, lead you to think about, which is incumbents and, uh, uh, and startups actually in, interact in very complicated and interesting ways. So the two examples here, this is the last time I'm going to cite my own research, but bear with me. And uh, for example, in my job market paper, I was talking about corporate venture capital. That was really kind of just linking this fact that startups are founded. 25% of their funding come from the incumbent firms. Why do incumbent firms actually want to do it? And what kind of benefit they can get from that? And then on the right-hand side is a joint paper that I had with Justin Murphy and Brian Pratt, who was thinking about the corporate investment and capital reallocation channel, which are basically talking about how capital investment goes from old firms to young firm as those machines age through the life cycle. But you get the sense, that is, we're talking about the economy with all kinds of firms, but young firms and old firms are different, therefore their interactions could be quite useful for us to think about the dynamism of this overall economy. And then the second direction that I want to talk about, which is quite relevant to the first one, is actually there's also a blurry line between public and private markets in general as well. If you actually think about what the traditional paradigm in this literature has been, is that, okay, private firms and private financing is very small, it is very independent from the public market, and there's a bunch of event study type of uh, research, which are quite useful, right, for us to think about how those kind of incentives and financing structure could be very helpful, a PE in terms of certain industry, what happens, and so on. But I think people now gradually realize that is, private equity is the new normal, and then the private investors and public investors, there's less of a very clear boundary uh, between them. For example, there are competition on complementarities between private and public markets, and also the investors actually could actually set a foot in each one of and each of them. Actually, I'm going to give you a couple of examples about that. VCs could invest in public market and public investment, like the mutual fund, could actually buy late stage VC deals as well. Therefore, like, are they investing in private market or public market, and why they want to do it? Those are open questions for you to think about. And then there's also financial regulation of different type of firms and how that could affect the dynamics of public and private and how the fundraising could affect uh, could be affected uh, in there and also how do we think about market efficiency in the world with a lot of privately held firms that are bearing a lot of risk but a lot of people cannot even hold the market portfolio right so those are a lot of the issues that we we can think about when the boundary becomes very blurry and the private firms proportion of the significance in the economy are right significantly so here are two recent work that I really like. The first one is Mike Evans and Joan Fermenza from 2020 at RFS, which are really thinking about how the dynamics of private uh, and, uh, and uh, public uh, status change and how firms make their decisions. And then what we find is that firms stay in private for a lot longer, and then the main channel they identify is the capital supply channel, which explains both the rise of private market uh, funding as well as how that squeezed out the public market uh, status, basically the disappearing IPO. On the right hand side from Peter Ewing and Michelle Lore, we actually look at an interesting phenomenon, which is how venture capital could, for, uh, could actually invest in public market on the portfolio companies that they help. This is something that we never knew, but they documented 15 to 20% of the VCs actually do that actively. Why? Because they are the prior, uh, they actually hold a lot of information that public traders do not really know, where therefore they actually could potentially complete the market by providing useful information and being paid for getting those information being priced in in 
into um, the proper price, uh, market prices. So the third one uh, that I think are really interesting is to think about players beyond firms. Okay, the traditional paradigm that we have been working on mainly focuses on firms, right? Why firms? Because data are readily available and firms are very easy to model. Okay, we think about firms being complicated. No, if you act, if you actually start to thinking about government, funding agencies, universities, and so on, those are much more complicated organizations. But they play a significant role, okay, in funding R and D investment. And uh, there's a huge opportunities to think about the funding of development uh, of R and D in this space, which is to bring our tools to think about things beyond firms themselves. Here are two recent papers that I really like. And the first one is by Bai, Bernstein, Dev, and uh, Lerner. Bai and Dev are two students, and Shai and Lerner are from HBS. And what they are talking about, they collected okay, public uh, entrepreneurial financing funding data for, uh, for more than 100 countries, and then tried to understand the government's, uh, government's role in funding R&D and entrepreneurship, and then tried to understand their relationships with private uh, uh, investors. That exactly kind of touches to the players like governments. And on the right hand side is by Pierre Zazule, Josh, and uh, Daniel, and uh, uh, and they were looking at NIH, which is the funding agency, how they operate, and how they could create um, uh, interesting incentives uh, by providing funding to scientific discoveries and what are the potential inefficiencies in it. Those are all efforts beyond firms. But they are all really interesting. In fact, this is one of the most active areas that I think people should put a lot of effort on because the data are readily available in this field as well. And then the fourth direction that what I say is what I call a behavioral foundation of entrepreneurship. And when we think about um, entrepreneurship, we created this thing called the Entrepreneurship Risk and Return Puzzle. Uh, and uh, from the framework of um, like the rational benchmark. Uh, but I think people start to realize, well, maybe it's time to borrow some insights from the development of behavioral finance and uh, think a little bit more about this by arguing that, okay, how do entrepreneurs and investors form their beliefs? What's their preferences? Is there, there a way to find cor and correct biases in entrepreneurial investment and so on? The two recent papers I want to uh, highlight is that here is Camille Bear from Toronto who was uh, in the market actually uh, uh, just a few years ago, um, who are really seriously taking stereotyping models by Schleifer et al. Um, to think about investor stereotyping and incorrect belief in forming their investment. On the right hand side is a GEP article that came out like eight years ago, but I think people didn't, uh, was not quite ready to buy it, but I think now is the right time, which is seeking the roots of entrepreneurship insights from behavioral economics. For those of you who are interested in this, I think this will be a great survey article to, to start. The last direction that I want to uh, spend a little bit of time on is to think about the modernized entrepreneurial finance innovation. That is, when we think about entrepreneurial finance innovation, we talk about the 1980s model of VC and the 1980s model of banks. But as Jigbo pointed out, now the landscape changed quite a bit over the years. And there are a lot of things that we can think about how small businesses are financed. You can think about the technology used in this, like AI and machine learning. You can think about new VC models. Now we have Evergreen Fund, which is significantly different from the old VC model. We also have FinTech lenders and so on. So the two recent papers, actually both of them come out this year. The one is uh, also this uh, is uh, from uh, Vincent and Leah, who are also very, very junior, uh, but are doing amazing work, which is to think about venture capital means allocation in the age of AI. And here is by Gopal and uh, Schnabel, uh, which is actually the editor's choice of RFS this very month. And we're thinking about how fintech lenders affect small business lending. Okay, those five directions, hopefully you get a sense of where I think um, no matter which your specialties and expertise are on, I hope you can think about them as potential areas to do work. Just general research advice in this specific field, I think uh, I'm not in the right position along those people who give advice, but this is ticket with uh, as a junior's perspective on uh, thinking about this. First of all, read broadly and uh, read beyond finance journals, read papers, read 
in vaccines, um, and read broadly about other fields as well. Second, be obsessed with institutional details, because those institutional details is where you actually can shine if you understand uh, your data better than the other people. And also balance your research portfolio. Some of those projects are very time uh, consuming. I have papers that you, I have the first draft after three or four years of work, but you also want to kind of balance that with some papers that are more traditional and so on. And um, anyways, I hope that you find this area exciting and uh, I look forward to seeing your exciting work. Thank you very much.